Thanks, Drew. Yeah, okay, just by way of introduction, um, my name's Liz. I've, I've been associated with, with Neolife for, for many years. Um, my background is one of being um, a dietitian. And um, I came into this market just because my intention or purpose for becoming a dietitian actually was to do consumer education. That's what I wanted to do. And this just seemed like the right platform. And But yet, nevertheless, what I decided to do after about 10 years or so was to actually go back and um, go back into my field and into private practice to see what the food was going to do. Let's talk more food. Um, in, like at New Life, we don't just say swallow tablets. We talk the food story. But nevertheless, in the general um, dietetic profession, we obviously encouraging people to eat the right foods, which we all know food is number one. That's the first thing we should be trying to achieve. But what I started to realize was there were some frustrations for me. I mean, many people are very successful in their private practices and many like to work in a clinical environment. But for me, um, I just found that the time that you have with somebody is to explain something and then you never really, you, quite often you don't see them very often. You might see them a couple of times after your consultation and then you never really know how they're doing. And so a one-on-one -on -one has value for sure, but it's, you can't seem to follow up. And I just found that very frustrating, not really knowing whether what I'd said or whether the dietetic profession was actually influencing um, what they were eating and their, their potential disease patterns, the reason for which they'd come to see you. And I think also that's another thing. You know, what we do in, in Neolife actually is more preventative. We're trying to educate people. And of course, we have this network of, of distributors who can go out there and keep repeating the same story, um, just reinforcing what people are reading or what they've heard before. It's, it's not, we're not coming out with anything magical or something amazing that no one else has ever heard before. We're simply talking the story that we should be talking about good nutrition. And so I just found that getting into, into an environment like this again, I came back and said, you know, let's, let's, I, I know I can have a greater influence by helping other people to get to read more things or to understand or for the penny to drop as to why they should change. And not always necessarily just see people when they're under threat or when the doctor says, if you don't go and do something, you know, you're going to get sick or, you know, you're going to go blind or something dramatic. Um, that's often when you see people. So in this way, we can actually, we do meet a lot of sick people and a lot of people expect quite a lot of, of the supplement, actually. They expect it to have a, a medical, um, sort of, it's not a med medical modality, it's actually a preventative agent and it's actually just a health providing agent, it's a nutrient. And we've simply delivered it in different forms. So Drew made reference to our scientific advisory board and they really are, they go back many, many years and are very well renowned around the world simply because um, nature is our blueprint and we, we go to whole foods and we don't go out of the human food chain. So in actual fact, really what we're doing is delivering certain aspects of foods, but just in a different delivery form, whether it be in a tablet or a powder or another liquid. So um, sure, eating food is the first prize. I just know, and I think most of us realize as hard as we try, we don't manage to achieve those dietary guidelines that are recommended to us. I mean, just an example is fruit and vegetables. We try, but on, it's, it's meant to be on a daily basis. And that's the thing, we're supposed to be doing all these good things every day. And I don't think all of us can achieve it just, just based on our lifestyles and, and you know, the demands of, of our modern living. So near life's, near life's passion and near life's mission is to fill those dietary gaps so that we can make an impact on the um, incidence of chronic diseases of lifestyle. Lifestyle diseases are things that you and I choose. They're not, they're not infectious, they're not contagious. They are diseases that we have some, some degree of influence over. And that would be things that we eat, the amount of exercise we do, whether we choose to, to smoke, whether we have enough sleep, all those kind of things. So there are personal choices, but we can modify them or tweak them, and that way we can modify and tweak our health. So that's really just um, a little bit about me and why I do what I do. And um, I really enjoy the fact that I'm not the only one doing it. I'm purely imparting information. I'm doing consumer education, as I always love to do. And people out there take the message, and our distributors can then influence all the people that they come into contact with because one individual is not going to meet everybody. But this way, we meet a huge number of people. And the message simply gets repeated on and on. Right, so let me share my screen. OK. Right, so we're going to talk about the gut and where bacteria and the immune system actually meet. And that might sound like 
something a little unusual. We, I mean, immunity is not something unusual right now. We're all talking about it all the time and it's a crucial part of our survival right now. And I think we've all learned a whole lot more than we ever knew before um, about the importance of our immune system and the importance of some of the foods that we eat. And of course, traditionally and, and around the world, there's been a lot of research about, um, you know, the fact that we should be having zinc and garlic and omega-3 and vitamin C, different nutrients. But in fact, we, we realize there's a whole lot more to that. So I want to get my slideshow. Right. So I'm going to talk from a different angle. And again, it's, it's, it's something that is out there and, and, and some of the terminology that we referenced tonight, you might have already seen, but perhaps didn't know how to put together. So we're gonna just piece it all together and talk about where these bacteria live in our bodies and in fact that they do. I think many of us probably aren't aware that humans have more bacterial cells in our bodies than we have human cells. And that might sound a bit weird to many of you, but it's, it's amazing how important the bacteria are to us and how we are to them. So we have a mutual benefit to each other provided we keep it all in balance. You know, and in the past, it was always thought that um, the purpose of having bacteria in our, in our systems, um, particularly in our, in our gut, because they live all around us, all over us, but in the gut, there, there's a very strong um, concentration of them. And we, we've tended to associate that more with um, fiber, for example, fermenting fiber, contributing energy, some of the nutrients, in fact. And so what we're realizing now is that there, there's a much greater and a much more far-reaching benefit to other aspects of our health that, that, that the bacteria that live in our systems actually contribute. So I'm calling them immune system partners. And as much as they don't look all that, that delightful, they live with us. And as I say, it's mutually beneficial and um, we need to learn to live with them and to look after them and to ensure that they can benefit us and we benefit them. So just some terminology, not because we have to go out and sound clever, but I think it's just because you're going to read this sort of terminology. So we have trillions, that's really the number of these um, little microorganisms that we have, which are mainly bacteria, but we do have viruses and fungi and other microorganisms that we don't have to, to name particularly. And collectively, this is known as our microbiota the combination or this complex of different microorganisms that live in you and I. Um, in fact, that's the term now that is being used. And together, because they all work together, some are friendly, some less friendly, but the whole idea is to get balance. Together they form our own internal ecosystem and that's called our microbiome. So these might be new words to you, the microbiota, which is the, the actual microorganisms together and they work with one another in an environment in our gut, and that's called our microbiome. So they live on and within our protective linings. So you might, you know, you might not think about it, but they're actually living on our skin, they're living in our nose, in our ears. They live with us, as I said, it, can, it should be and is typically a mutually beneficial relationship. But if we think about, so our skin, our respiratory and digestive systems have these protective linings for our bodies. Um, they are part of our defense system. You know, our skin is a barrier. Our respiratory system is an external barrier. We might breathe something in, but it doesn't get into the body unless we've managed it. And very often we can exhale it. And of course, our digestive system is a whole process, as you can see there. It's actually a process of piping. Um, and I... I like to say, you know, it's not sterile. That's the whole reason it's not sterile. I mean, we've got bacteria living in there, so it clearly is not sterile. It's not intended to be. That's the amazing part of the way we're made. And so probably in, in a simple way, we're open at the North Pole and the South Pole. So we're a whole series of just piping that, that while it's inside the shape of our body, it's actually not inside the systems of the body. It's not in, in the bloodstream, for example. It's almost an exterior part of the body within the shape of the body, if that makes sense. So it's tubing or piping that's within us. We can't see it, but it's not actually directly inside the workings of our body. It's part of the process though. So as our immune system partners, each of us has our own unique microbiota. In other words, we have our own unique balance of different bacteria. And the largest concentration of them 
is in fact in the large intestine, which is also called the colon. So that's two different names, just so that we're aware of it. The large intestine, because I, the tubing or piping um, starts you know, at the mouth, goes down the, the, the esophagus, once we've swallowed, into the stomach, and then food gets pushed into the intestine. And the intestine is a small intestine, which looks like sort of a whole lot of pork sausages packed together. And then there's a large intestine that goes around that, um, which is the, the last part of the digestive process. And that large intestine is also known as the colon. So they're one and the same thing. So our collection, our individual collection of our bacteria and all the other little microorganisms actually live in the lining of our intestine predominantly. And that's kind of a barrier. So remember I said it's a whole lot of piping or tubing and the relationship or where the, the, the inside of the body and the outside of the body, this tubing actually meet is a line, you know, obviously is a line of, of, of cells. And in fact, it's only one cell thick, which is, you know, it's very delicate when you consider that it's, it's, it is the barrier from the inside to the outside of the body. And so we call this the gut barrier. And it's crucially important that that is kept in good condition. As I say, only one cell thick. Um, and there are all sorts of different things that can, you know, if it's not in good condition, you can imagine substances that aren't fully properly digested, they get into the body when they shouldn't, they cause allergies and discomfort. Um, we have what the, the terminology of a leaky gut, that's where that gap might, might be created. So there are many situations that are undesirable if that gut barrier is not in good condition. So these bacteria help by, for example, digesting and, and fermenting that, that fiber from a digestive point of view and actually feeding the, those cells that make up that lining give them energy, but in fact, the bacteria that come along there also have to live in that lining. And this is what we're gonna talk about this evening. Because just below that, that cell, it's a one cell thick barrier from the outside to the inside, our immune cells living just below there. And so this is what's interesting is that they actually talk to each other. Our bacteria living in that lining communicate with those immune cells just below that line. And that partnership forms, and that, that is, as I said, those are in the system. So I talked about on the skin, I talked about in the digestive tract, this is where we are in the digestive tract. And so that's our first line of immune defense right there at that barrier action. So those bacteria, bacteria are crucially important for various reasons. And provided that gut bacteria lining is good, we're in business. And then also they have to be present in order that they can communicate with our immune cells. So that's quite an interesting thing. And that's why I call them immune system partners. I'm sure a lot of people don't realize how important our gut bacteria are to our, our general immunity, because it doesn't just stop at the level of the gut. Once they've influenced and interacted with the immune cells, those immune cells move all over the body. And so it actually has a very, very broad impact on our general well-being and our immune system in general. So these, are, as I said, we have an individual level of bacteria and a little sort of ecosystem within each one of us. Starts, you know, right from birth. We actually are, what we start with is what we get from our mother. And of course, um, we have various concentrations and you can see here, we just have, some of them are more dominant when we were little ones. And then as we get older, sort of balances out. And of course, as we get elderly, certain bacteria balances actually get upset. And so there is a change um, in variety and the stability um, of our microbiome as we actually get older. So we have to be cautious or careful of that. We have to make sure as little ones that they have enough for their own immunity so that we reduce things like, like allergies, for example, and that they can withstand certain challenges that they're going to meet in the early stages of their lives. But also as we get elderly and we're all living a lot longer, it's a big deal to make sure that our gut bacteria um, need you know, have got some help because it's a part of the aging process. So there are many different influences um, and influences that actually um, can affect this balance. Even perhaps, you know, we, we don't have to be little ones and we don't have to be elderly, just in our normal course of living. Um, and you can see there, it, it, the, just things like the diet and exercise and basic the foods that we take in and the choices that we make. And as I pointed out in the beginning, you know, our, our mission is to make the world a healthier and happier place and to make an impact on the, the incidence of these chronic diseases of lifestyle. 
And right here, it's been proven because we completely based in science. So we're not, we're not making up things that people can't read or not referenced, that you can go out and find and read for yourselves. It's well researched that quality diets and exercise and having the right bacteria are going to make a huge difference to our, our own microbiome and to our own immune system. Look, genetics will play a part, we know that, in tipping the scale, if you like, in, in all sorts of ways, even in diseases of lifestyle. So the fact that we, we know that means that we should not really pull the trigger on things. If we're aware of something, perhaps in our, in our genetics or in our family history, then we should be aware and know that we shouldn't, we can live a perfectly normal life, but let's just not swing the scale in favor of that particular condition. Let's, be, let's read up on it, let's be aware of it, let's be educated and say, I'm not going to set this off. If we have sugar levels that are fluctuating and then and perhaps we have pre-diabetes or even diabetes in our families, then we need to look at our own personal intake of things and see what we can do to not pull that trigger. It doesn't have to happen. So genetics is a kind of, can, can go either way. And of course, the, the things that are you know, neg negatively impact um, the quality of our microbiome and therefore our eventually our immune system will be the fact that we use antibiotics more often than we should. Um, and if we just look at those two words, we'll talk about them later, but you just look at probiotic and antibiotic. So probiotic means pro-life. And an antibiotic is intended to dispose of something or kill it. So it, in other words, it's anti-life, if you like. Now that's not altogether negative. Sometimes we have to have an antibiotic, but I think there was a time not so long ago where antibiotics were being dispensed just you know, for everything. And that wasn't helping our systems at all. And, and we had to learn that the hard way. So we can upset the balance of our microbiome by in actual fact taking too many antibiotics on a regular basis. Obviously environmental factors, we all know that pollution, even substances in our, the foods that we have are going to influence how our bodies work Stress has many, many different impacts on our body. They're not all fully understood, but we certainly know that there's, there's influence in our general well-being, and it affects our gut too. So we're talking about immunity, but I mean, our, our gut is actually considered the second brain. I mean, our brain and our, and our intestine actually talk to each other. And so there's many, many emotional components that come out of the gut as well. And that's a, that's a topic for another day, but as, you know, as amazing as this, gut is in basic tubing that it is, it's a very, very powerful part of our well-being. But we're gonna to stick to the, its influence on our immune system this evening. So yeah, an unbalanced intestinal microbiome actually has, you know, has its negative connotations, has its negative impacts. And there are just some of those little bacteria, they don't look too friendly, but they, they are there. And it's, it's, it's now known that the elements of the diet, in other words, our macronutrients, some of the carbohydrates we might eat, micronutrients, that's vitamins and minerals, the fiber that we eat, polyphenols. Um, in our sort of world, we talk about flavonoids, they're part of that big family. They influence the composition of these gut, um, your gut microbiota, your, in other words, your microorganisms. And they can cause a shift in these different populations, even if it's at some point unbalanced um, and not working in your favor. But I think you just from this sort of picture, you can actually see that the tubing and inside all that convoluted tubing, that's the sort of, that's the exterior part of the body. Um, that, the, the, that tubing that has all the nutrients come in when we swallow them and go through the system and move, the waste moves out the other end. And we're trying to make sure that that lining between the two is very important and in good condition. So we're all about bacteria, microbiota and our microbiome. So I wanna just, talk from there really about um, the influences of probiotics. I talked about antibiotics and now the term probiotics um, is a well-known term now. And as I said, it means for life. And according to the World Health Organization, it is and they are live microorganisms that when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host. That's, that's a definition that has been sort of approved by and put forward by the World Health Organization. They're living microorganisms, your microbiota, that when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. So the host is you and I, and we have to get it either from our foods or we can supplement, introduce them into the body. Now, the most well studied, if you like, um, belonged to, of, these, of these 
bacteria because that's what we've got in this product. Three, we've got three different strains. Two most specifically, you can see the Lactobacillus and the Bifidobacterium. Those are the two main strains that we have, but we also have a Streptococcus strain. These are specifically, they've been around many, many years, very, very well researched and very, you know, those clinically tested bacteria. So the Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium, um, as I said, two of the most well-known from years back and have a, a, a sort of a high level of safety. And what they do is, because they've been so well researched, we know that they improve our, our lactose tolerance. A lot of people will say, well, I, you know, I can't take milk, I can't take dairy products because I, I, can't, I can't digest them properly. These particular bacteria, actually in spite of the fact that they are derived from dairy sources, they actually produce lactase, which is the very substance that we need as an enzyme that enables you and I to actually break down the dairy products and enable us to actually digest them. So lactase is the enzyme that we need. And these particular bacteria, the, lact the lactobacillus and the bifidobacterium are ones that actually produce lactic acid and lactase. And there is also, there was a, um, a fifth one, the streptococcus family, which is actually also a lactic acid producing bacteria and also produces lactase. And that's one that would have been typically used um, in the classical production of, of yogurt. Because this, if we go back, yogurt is really what was considered is a probiotic. Okay, it, it provides these bacteria because that's that's what's being used to actually ferment and, and, and make a yogurt from, from the dairy source. So nowadays, of course, I think many of us know that yogurt is not yogurt anymore. So if it's just flavored and you, there's no guarantee that you're even going to get any sort of probiotic in there. So you have to be much more selective about the sort of of the yogurts that we buy and that we give to our children. You know, it's become a fashion sort of product and a fashion food now, but in actual fact, it doesn't really have the typical benefits that yogurt specifically should have. Yogurt was made due to the presence of these bacteria. That's actually how it originated. So um, we know because of, as I say, these are, these are bacteria of old, that they improve the lactose tolerance, which is an important thing. So don't get put off by the fact, that's why I put that picture there to show you dairy sources. Some of you are saying, oh, I can't eat that. You actually can because we're providing you with the, this is actually enabling the enzyme to be produced so that you can digest them. They also inhibit the growth of disease causing bacteria because they they balance out. Remember I said we've got trillions of these bacteria and these particular ones, the probiotics, pro-life, are the ones there that are trying to balance against the perhaps disease causing bacteria that we will have because we're this is not a sterile environment. So we're going to, in different ways, end up with some bacteria that are undesirable um, in our system and we have to balance that out. So they inhibit the growth of these disease causing, potentially disease causing ones. They also promote colon health. In other words, remember the large intestine um, because that's really where the, where we are uh, the end of our digestive processes. That's where the waste is being produced and some of the, it's the last stage at which the body can actually still take back some of the nutrients, some of the fluids, and there might even be some nutrients in that part of the, of the digestive tract that will still occur, but it's really where the waste is, is actually congregating. And so beneficial populations of bacteria um, will reduce the production actually of some toxic substances that might otherwise be you know, produced in that area simply because it's all waste. Some of them are quite honestly even cancer causing agents. So we need to make sure that we have an efficient system. It's not that this product specifically is going to prevent that disease. It's just that it's enabling the body to prevent it in general. So in other words, they, they work in the colon and they reduce the production of toxic substances. And also they produce in general, a wide range of antibiotic substances. So they are also there to make sure that we reduce or eliminate those substances that are going to cause damage or disease. So they almost are nature's antibiotic once they're in your, in your system. So as I said, they have a long history of safe use. Now, the interesting thing is just because something is a fermentable food, um, as I said, some of those yogurts, for example, just because they're there doesn't mean that they are a true uh, probiotic. The bacterial strain has to have been proven to have 
health benefits before it can be classified as a probiotic. So remember the World Health Organization has a definition. So provided it can comply and confer benefits to the host, then it can be considered a probiotic. But if, it has no, if there's no classification or it hasn't been categorized in a particular family and there is no clinical proof that that particular strain of bacteria that might be living in your system is in fact beneficial to the host or you, then it's not considered a probiotic. So that's quite interesting. It's not just because they are friendly bacteria and we think all fermented foods because they ferment as a result of these bacteria fermenting them that they would automatically be probiotics. And one, what I was quite surprised at actually too, is that something sometimes like in traditional foods, sauerkraut, for example, which we know is a, is a fermented product, a fermented food, it's a fermented food of old, um, is actually not considered a true probiotic food. Because in fact, the, the bacteria that cause that fermentation actually have not been classified in any particular category. And so they are not considered, according to the World Health Organization's um, definition, True, uh, true probiotic. So it's quite interesting. So this is, this is also, as I was saying about food being the first prize, but we as consumers are not always aware of all the things that we should be eating. And, we, we, and nowadays we read all sorts of things and everybody's putting all sorts of ideas in our heads. And so we try all these new different things and this is the answer and that's the secret. And in fact, we've got to simply stick to the basics, but we need to know that those basics are basic and that they are good for us and that there is some science and that's what science does, science investigates things. So science investigates nature as well and says, what is nature providing? Does this come from, does it come from nature? Is it the way nature intended it to be delivered to the body? Have we modified it and fiddled with it so much to make it fashionable that it, you know, that it actually isn't good for us anymore? As natural as it might've started out. So those are the interesting challenges that I think we all, we all going to meet. And as I say, that's why it's preferable for us to be able to, and for me in particular, to be able to just put that out there so I don't have all the answers I'm simply a messenger but it makes us learn a few new words each time we we, we listen to something new or we, our scientists put something out that we can all read so that we actually start when we read other things start to become informed and, and knowledgeable and selective about the things that we prepare to take from from people advertising things for us so yeah so that's what we basically have and I want to just talk a little bit about this product, Acidophilus Plus. And you might be surprised to know that in actual fact, we, we brought this product out two decades ago. And yet that wasn't when things like probiotics were really being talked about. But I think for those of you who've been around a while with Near Life, and certainly I've seen it, and those of you who are looking in will start to realize that our scientific advisory board are a very, very pioneering group of, of scientists. And they really have stuck to their, their principle of using nature as the blueprint and trying to deliver to the body how things as nature intended. And always, I've, I've, I'm constantly amazed that anything that has been brought out has always been brought out ahead of its time because what they've did, done is said, okay, what's happening in the food industry? What is the consequence of something like this happening to our bodies, maybe 20, 30 years time? So they start to develop products well ahead of the curve, well ahead of any problem that's going to come. So something like a probiotic was really, I mean, that word wasn't even being used 20 years ago. And there certainly wasn't, you know, full on definitions about it. But it was probably even more than 20 years ago. But yet we, 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 we stuck to the basics, the ones that people knew, the lactobacillus, the bifidobacterium and the streptococcus, because we had an understanding of how they worked. And we stuck, with, we stuck with that, we stuck with nature and we delivered those ingredients as bacteria, just simply in a different form and in a concentrated form. And I think under these circumstances where our gut is so, it's, it's so prone to getting out of balance and so important for our general health, that to bring something in in a concentrated form like this, because as I said, our yogurts, which would have been a, a very good source of these nutrients um, or substances, is not yogurt really, the majority of them are not yogurts anymore. So we have to really look at another way of trying to deliver these substances to our bodies because these diseases of lifestyle um, are really going in the wrong direction. We really, as a population, simply don't have a lid on it in spite of all our knowledge. So to get things delivered in a concentrated form and targeted to where you want them to go and work there is crucially important now for, our, for, our, for most of us. 
however well we try to eat. So if we just look at what was, was put together that many years ago, using, as I say, things that have been well tested and, and tried and nothing unusual or something that people have never heard of, the basic bacteria that people know live in our gut. And so what we did is we, we took 5 billion of these live microorganisms and put them in a capsule. That's about the equivalent of about 10 servings of yogurt. So that's pretty concentrated. And that's the yogurt that has bacteria in it. And we encapsulated it. And this is, this is very interesting. I just want to talk you through how that, this actually works because it's rather unique on the marketplace. Um, there are, as I say, many of them on the marketplace. And it doesn't mean that they don't work, but many of them have different strains and new, you know, new strains are coming out and there is new research, but not all of them are fully classified. Um, and a lot of it still, does it work, doesn't it work? Has it been around long enough to know that it's gonna work for everybody? So these are tried and tested bacteria. So 5 billion of them. And what we've done is we've encapsulated it. So we've got a you know, gelatine capsule coating around it. And then of course you swallow it, as you can see it going down from the throat, you know, from your mouth down through the throat into the stomach. And the stomach for all of us is the most acidic part of our whole body. It's meant to be because it's actually meant to protect us. It's meant to actually catch things like bacteria, for example, or poisonous substances and try and eliminate them before they get further down that tubing and potentially get through the tubing and into the bloodstream. So it's meant to be highly acidic. And so what we have to do is to make sure that those bacteria don't get affected in the stomach because that's not what we want them to be released. We want them to be released, remember, right down in the colon or the large intestine because that's where the, the dominant number of them are and where they make their most impact. So we we also, went, if, even if it got through the stomach, just into the upper intestine, we're going to produce bile salts to try and to be able to digest fats. And that in turn as well is going to have a different balance on the, on the um, effect of these bacteria and the, and the chances of them surviving. So we put a very special coating, which we call gel guard, just inside the lining of that gelatine capsule. So that even when, and more than likely, that gelatine capsule is going to dissolve in that stomach acid, what it does, as soon as that capsule the, the capsule coating dissolves, this sort of matrix, it's made from food starches, actually just, it almost solidifies and it actually looks, it, 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 it traps those bacteria and looks after them. Now those bacteria are living, but they are dehydrated. And so they are, if you like, asleep. And they are being protected though, until that, whatever's being eaten with them and whatever's being pushed out. So we don't have to worry about whether there's food present or not. Because um, a lot of people wonder, when is the best time to take the Acidophilus Plus? And in fact, because of this protection process, we really realize that in fact, it doesn't matter whether there is or isn't something in the stomach. It doesn't matter whether there's food present. It's not going to hinder its absorption or potential for absorption. And if, it's, if the stomach has not got any other foods, the amount of acid that's present just to work on that capsule is not going to be damaging to the capsule or that matrix at all. So it's not really that crucial um, exactly what timing you, you take it. You can take it if there is food in the system or if you have an empty stomach. But either way, it's going to eventually get pushed out of your stomach and into the intestine and move further down. But it's not going to release those bacteria there, which is why we call it intestine targeted because it gets pushed further and further down. And while there are some bacteria living further up the intestine, we want it to get further down into the colon. And slowly as it gets into a more friendly environment, the sort of matrix starts to release and, it, and the bacteria get gently released and they start to then rehydrate in a friendly environment and they start to get to work because they recognize what they have to do. They're from different food sources. The body knows how to use them. And that's when they get to work into the lining of our digestive system, start working on any foods or fibers or whatever that need fermentation. And they start producing all the good things, the energy that is needed for the cells, the, all the things that I mentioned before from an immune point of view, they make sure that that gut lining is in good condition and so that, that the immune cells can actually talk to the bacteria and do all the things that I've mentioned before. So a very unique um, on the marketplace um, because it has this ability to actually be specifically targeted. And we guarantee that they will actually be released in the friendly environment and they will survive. 
the stomach acid in the bowel salts. So I guess in a nutshell, really what they're doing for you and I as partners in our immune system is that they're providing a stable environment in our intestine, which is what we best we can ask for. We have bacteria, they live with us, some are friendly, some less so, but as long as the populations are in balance, we're happy, our body's happy, and it can work optimally. And this is what we're doing, doing we're delivering friendly bacteria, probiotics in, in this form to make sure that those populations stay well balanced. And as a result, they then support the gut barrier function, crucially important to all of us, and in turn enable the immune cells that are sitting right there on the other side of that barrier, to talk to the ones on this side of the barrier. Between the two of them, they then influence not just what happens in the gut now, but those immune cells are going to get all over the body and influence the well-being of, of all of us. And right now, the threats that we are all exposed to, it doesn't mean that we don't get exposed to a threat. It really means that we manage ourselves much more effectively when our immune system is on our side rather than it being compromised um, before it gets attacked by some external force. And then, of course, now the seasons are changing, so we have other challenges and other people around us also likely to present other challenges to our immune system. So right now, it's crucially important that we all make sure that our immune system partners are working on our, on our behalf. And we need to think a little bit further beyond just the fruit and vegetables and the, the zinc and the omega. They're all important. But remember, your gut is an innate part of you, and it's, it's unique to you, and it needs to work for you. Um, and it certainly will if we work with it. Right, so that's 